So um, if uh, there are any folks on your team that weren't able to join, um, or uh, if we go through the material today and there are things that you'd like to revisit, we will be sharing the recording with everybody. Um, so please feel free to share that with your team or uh, you'll have access to it and you can go back through it at any point in time. Um, I'm Nimish Shukla. I am the co-founder and COO here at LifeRaft. Um, and we are a full service broker focused uh, HRA platform. Um, I'm really excited about today's material because I think, you know, there's been a lot of chatter and discussion around ICRA specifically, the individual coverage HRA. And I was just at a conference yesterday. I'm going to one next week. Um, everybody's thinking about and talking about ICRA. I think it's become a real uh, viable solution for a number of groups, right? Particularly those that are facing, I think, cost pressures, when they have traditional group health insurance. But here at LifeRaft, both the way that we view the HRA market and also how we've actually built our platform to work with producers and brokers, I think really unlocks the real value of the HRA to not only help service your existing clients and address any challenges that they might have, but also really think outside the box creatively to be able to expand your book of business, right? HRA is so much broader than just the individual coverage HRA um, that is used um, primarily for health insurance premiums only. Um, and you need the right technology and you need the right partner to be able to deliver solutions like that. But when you can, you can you can really do some, I think, interesting and creative things for different uh, clients that you might have or clients that you're hoping to work with. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Today's webinar is gonna be exclusively focused on three case studies where our team has worked with uh, brokers to be able to implement solutions for companies that were looking to solve a really potentially complex and challenging benefits um, uh, issue that they were coming across uh, and and the HRA ended up being the right fit for each of those different case studies. Um, and so let's go ahead and, and just dive in. Um, so we'll talk first about a solution that came to us from a very large brokerage in the Midwest. They had a university client um, that had probably, I think they have about 2,000 employees of varying different types, right? At a university, you've got folks that are administrative in capacity, you have folks that are working kind of facilities that might be hourly, you're going to have professors uh, that are full time, that is their primary job. And then you're oftentimes going to have adjunct professors that are, you know, that are full time employees, but aren't necessarily working the full 30 hours a week, uh, depending on the semester. And in this university's case, those adjunct professors um, were on strike. And one of their primary requests was healthcare coverage. So if you're a university in the Midwest, you have a population of workers um, that's pretty sizable, right? Over 500 of these part-time faculty that are looking for healthcare coverage. Um, that becomes a real challenge to put all of those people on your fully insured group health plan. And so, you know, kind of the, the, um, the quick takeaway um, in, in what we were able to do is working with the broker, actually utilize an ICRA um, to define narrow employee classes that covered the striking adjunct professors within the college's budget to be able to reimburse those adjunct professors and part-time employees for their health insurance premiums. Now, in this case, right, fully insured group health plan wasn't really going to work. Uh, the company didn't have the budget or the, the university didn't have the budget for it. Um, and it was just going to be way too expensive. Uh, and they're really outside of that, other than grossing out pay, there weren't a lot of other alternative solutions for uh, this pretty large segment of their uh, of their employee base. And so with the ICRA, we were actually able to offer them a cost effective solution, right? So one of the big challenges here and the way that we were able to utilize the ICRA that's a little bit different than what you might see in terms of, hey, let's just give everybody an ICRA and make our coverage a lot cheaper, right? We had to be super strategic about which employees were going to be offered the ICRA, 
which employees were going to be offered fully insured and utilize employee classing to be able to carve up the employee base in a way that we were able to do this in a in, uh, to ensure that the solution was compliant for the university as well, right? Given the university's budget of about two hundred thousand dollars a year, um, they really were limited in terms of you know one how far could they stretch it, but number two like ensuring that we were very specific. So um, you know when it comes to ICRA, right at a at a system level. Uh, the ICRA legislation does enable you to class employees in a way where certain class of employees can receive group health insurance benefits, while other classes of employees receive the ICRA benefit. Now, there are size limitations, and you have to ensure the minimums are met. But as long as those are met, uh, the regs actually give us enough flexibility to be able to carve up populations like this. And so in a situation like the one we face here, what we were able to do is carve up uh, folks based on the union that they were a part of and also whether they were classified as full-time uh, and part-time and then layering on salary versus hourly, which got very, very complex with this university. Um, but ultimately, the university um, uh, uh, is implementing an ICRA for all of these professors um, that are now going to be able to utilize and take those ICRA reimbursements and that budget and actually go utilize that those funds towards the purchase of individual health coverage. The added interesting kind of layer here that, that was some additional complexity we worked through here is when looking at a, you know, essentially a, what is a seasonal essentially employee base, um, where some professors might teach in the fall semester, they may not teach in the spring, they may have other jobs, they may not have other jobs. Um, a lot of those uh, employees actually had marketplace coverage already today. Um, and in certain instances, they were available for tax credits. Uh, and so this was a way for us to really devise a budget that was going to give the uh, the the employees as much of a reimbursement as possible, but also make it so that the university's budget uh, was was really met and very close to exactly where they wanted to be. Um, so to dive in a little bit, and and we've talked a little bit about this, right? Um, in terms of you know really digging into employee classes, as I mentioned, the ICRA allows us to class employees, <clears throat> and and most importantly make the determination as to whether they are going to be offered group health coverage or ICRA coverage. Um, now, the nice thing here as well is when you're thinking about your book of business, um, employee classes can also be utilized for different levels of an ICRA reimbursement, right? So if you've got clients that are geographically diverse, uh, and you have employees in New York and you have employees in Colorado, right? The cost of group health or the cost of individual coverage in New York is very, very different than Colorado, and it's way more expensive in New York. Utilizing the framework that the regulations have given us, we can actually offer different ICRA reimbursements to take into account um, the fact that health insurance costs uh, are different in different states where employees may reside. Um, and we we can work with your team on what is the best way to classify employees in this client that I have? How do we think about the reimbursement structures? Um, and for these groups that are larger as well, how do I make sure that they're meeting ACA compliance, right? That is a big piece here uh, that we shouldn't forget, which is we help um, ensure that your reimbursement strategies that you recommend to clients and that they implement are going to keep them ACA compliant from an affordability perspective. And classes can become a very important and critical piece of determining that eligibility. So, you know, I, I want to take a step back and really think about, okay, you know, with plain vanilla ICRAs, right, again, the really becoming, uh, I would say, a lot more popular um, what is kind of the difference in implementation and how you think about structures and solutions here? And 
you know, with a with an ICRA that's just going to replace group health insurance and everybody's getting a reimbursement, uh, that can be a lot more straightforward. Um, but, you know, it's really taking the client's challenge, which is we have a large population. They want some access to health care and we do not have the budget to give them a fully insured option. What can we do about that? And really thinking creatively about taking the regs as they're written, making sure that your client is compliant, but really being able to devise a solution that is totally custom to them. Um, we have other groups where we can we we have and we do similar uh, ICR strategies for them, but the way that we actually implement those, what's in the plan documents, who, what employee is getting, what reimbursement is all very, very specific. And so we really give our producers an opportunity to be able to customize a solution rather than just saying, well, we just do ICRA, here's what it is. Um, so ICRA can be a really, really powerful tool. Uh, as, a, as a reminder here, it can be a very powerful tool uh, when you have when you have clients that are in really difficult benefit situations like this one. Um, I should I should add, and, and I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, if there are any questions that come up as I'm going through the materials, uh, please feel free to drop those in the q and I'll keep an eye on that. Uh, and so if any questions are coming up, I'm happy to answer those as, as we're going through the materials. So let, let's move on um, to a second case study. Um, this was a company um, that we worked with directly, actually. They didn't have a broker. Uh, they were with a small PEO. And with the health coverage that was offered to them, um, they had just recently done an employee satisfaction survey and asked employees, hey, if, if we were going to be able to provide you uh, other benefits, what exactly are you looking for? Um, and two things came back on that employee survey, which then spurred the, the owner and the head of HR really to start looking for solutions to be able to address those. And the first was uh, mental health services. We wish we had better mental health coverage. Uh, and the second was we wish we had more coverage for reproductive care. Now, um, I want to talk about each of those benefits uh, um, individually because I think the challenge in those is slightly different, right? Um, mental health providers and and the benefits are are a really interesting use case for the HRA here for two reasons. Number one, oftentimes group coverage is going to have some level of a mental health benefit, right? Whether your client's getting it through a PEO or whether it's a fully insured product that you've placed as as a producer there are likely going to be mental health benefits built in. The biggest challenge with mental health benefits is oftentimes employees have pre-existing relationships with their mental health providers and their therapists. And if you're transitioning coverage to different carriers or even sometimes within the same plan, um, the challenge that employees face is when they have a pre-existing relationship, if that provider becomes out of network, they're often going to pick the provider and they're now paying out of pocket to go see the provider of choice, right? And so with mental health specifically, the, the, the health insurance plan that we select can have serious implications for the costs that employees are facing uh, when they're seeking mental health services. So that's on that side. On the reproductive side, right, um, some services are usually covered, but as we get into fertility benefits, for example, um, fertility benefits in certain states and, and depending on the carrier, you do have the option of adding a fertility rider into a lot of group health insurance plans. And if you're in New York or if you're in California, um, you know, uh, carriers are going to be mandated by the state to at least have an option for you available. So you know, there are some states where that isn't even available in the states where it is, you can add a rider. But the, the challenge with riders is what you're doing is to provide that benefit to maybe a select few that may need it. You're actually increasing premiums for the entire group. And so the entire group is actually um, is actually uh, sharing the burden and the cost 
for the benefit that only a select few might lead, right? So, so this group was facing both of these on the reproductive side. Hey, we can't even get a rider, but if we got a rider, um, it's going to be an additional three grand per employee per year that we're having to spend uh, on the premium and on mental health. Our employees know they have uh, they have providers that they like, and a lot of them are out of network for the plan that we've chosen. Um, and that's really where I think HRAs can be incredibly powerful. So this is sometimes called a, a GCHRA uh, or an IHRA, so group coverage HRA or integrated HRA. Uh, we at, at LifeRaft call it a specialty HRA because it really is designed and can be carved up uh, to cover specialty services. Uh but the group, the group um, uh, worked with with LifeRaft, and we were able to implement a, a group HRA, so a GCHRA, to reimburse employees for mental health and reproductive health services. Um, so let let's look a little bit about you know at that. Um, so for this this client specifically, um, they did again move forward with the GCHRA now. With the, the group HRAs, um, all of these are reimbursement-based models. So an employee goes and gets a service, whether it's mental health, whether it's for reproductive, regardless of that provider, right? There's no network. You don't have to worry about in-network, out-of-network anymore. It is simply, hey, your employer is giving you money. Go get the care that you need. Go get the mental health care that you need. Go get the reproductive care um, that you need. And then the group is going to help cover a portion or potentially all of the expenses that you might have, depending on how they set it. Um, now, for this company, because they were based in California, what they did is they really designed their HRA budgets and limits based on the cost of care in California. Um, and so we use that as a reference, and then we designed a custom benefit structure for the company. So you know, what, what is a custom benefit structure within the confines of the HRA, right? When you think about a GCHRA or specialty HRA, let's take each, let's take each benefit that they built out um, individually. So reproductive health services for this employer, right? There are a list of different services that can or can't be covered with HRA funds. What the employer did was we went through the entire list of available services related to reproductive health um, and selected the ones that they either knew were already very important for employees because they had heard from them in that survey or anecdotally through conversations um, or ones that they thought, you know, hey, we as a company want to make a, a policy that we're going to cover certain expenses. Um, and so with this company, it was very comprehensive. They did a full kind of reproductive health services coverage. Um, now, some of these, you know, uh, for those of you that might be familiar with like IVF services, right? IVF, again, if you don't have the rider, uh, pretty much every time it is not going to be covered with health insurance, meaning your employees are completely out of pocket. Um, so with this company, they offer employees $2,500 per year, right? Which is about uh, about a, a quarter uh, uh, about a one fourth of the total cost of one, one cycle of IVF in the, in the state of California, depending on where you're at. Um, but for them, they said, okay, we can cover $2,500 really with the eye towards, okay, if IVF is going to be probably one of our more expensive services and procedures that we want to be able to contribute towards, let's use a round of IVF as, the reference price and then set how much we want to reimburse towards it. And that's where they came up with the $2,500. Um, and what they did is actually add in a lifetime maximum spend by employee. So what that really means is if you have an employee or this company has an employee uh, that's seeking IVF services, they're going to get essentially coverage towards four cycles of IVF once a year uh, for four years until this benefit is capped out. So you know, really for, for those of you that kind of play in the, the self-insured world, right, this becomes a really interesting way for a company to build effectively a self-insured coverage, right, by service area, but also cap their liability. No stop loss, you know, you don't have to worry about any of that. It really becomes, hey, we want to give everybody $2,500. Now, 
the last thing I want to mention here is um, folks might be thinking, well, they're giving everybody $2,500 a year. That's actually a lot of money and way more expensive than if they just added the rider on the group health insurance coverage, which is true. But one thing to keep in mind here, going back to the last slide, is that everything with, with the HRA is a reimbursement-based model. So you are giving your employees a $2,500 budget for services in the event that they utilize them. But the way that it's designed is unless your service is a part of the specific services covered by your plan, for example, as we've listed here, um, uh, like uh, birth control pills, right? Or fertility enhancement. So the, 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 um, the, the course of, uh, hormone um, injections that are uh, required prior to egg retrieval and potentially implantation. Like, unless it is those very specific services, uh, your um, your service will not be covered. And so because it's a utilization-based account, you're giving everybody a $2,500 budget, but the reality is the company um, is potentially spending a lot less than that for providing what ends up becoming a very rich reproductive health benefit. Um, now, they also had mental health services, right? They had two benefits built into their HRA. With the mental health benefit, they wanted to offer $1,200 a year in coverage. It's about $100 a month. Um, and um, uh, the the idea is, as we kind of you know, have chatted about this a little bit, but really it's to enable employees to go see the therapist of their choice. Um, and this could be used towards copays. It could be used towards uh, just a complete out-of-pocket uh, coverage. And so for those, those employees that may have a service provider that's out of network, this is going to cover about one therapy session a month. Um, and for those that may have a provider that's in network, the plan can also help cover uh, some expenses towards co-pays. And so it could be upwards of three or four, depending on the plan structure. Uh, so this became a very, very rich and a very, very popular benefit across the company. Um, and so they have very strong participation. But the interesting thing is, as a company kind of predicted and had hoped happened, is the mental health dollar utilization is high. So we know employees are utilizing that. The reproductive care one, the utilization is actually... Uh, a little bit lower, right? It's, a, it's actually a lot bit lower. But again, employees know that they have that account to fall back on in the event that they need those services. And that's really, I think, how you create a, uh, a again, a customized, a fully tailored solution to a group uh, and one that becomes really cost affordable for them as well, particularly in the light of uh, continued cost rises on the fully insured group health side. So let's go ahead and and, and talk about um, scenario three. And this this one's a really interesting one. Again, we worked in partnership with, in this case, actually, uh, it, yeah, we worked with a broker in this case um, who had a nonprofit organization uh, client based in Arizona. Um, the nonprofit was facing pretty significant cost increases on their group health insurance. Uh, they had about 30 people, I believe, if, if I remember correctly, they were getting a 22% rate increase. Um, and so the group really had to do something about, you know, reducing their health insurance costs. And now the group had kind of already made the decision, hey, we're going to go ahead and move from the plan that we have today, which was a $500 deductible plan, everybody, um, you know, close to 100% participation. We're gonna we're gonna have to move to a uh, 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 um, a plan that is um, uh, cheaper on our premiums, but those deductibles are gonna go up to two thousand dollars. Now, um, they saved a pretty significant amount by making this transition. The challenge for them, though, was both for them as the employer, but also I think the the initial uh, feedback from employees was okay that's a pretty significant increase in our deductible. Um, and that doesn't feel great. And I think both the company and the employees felt that. And so the group was really looking for ways to be able to provide something of value that was going to hopefully help address that that change in deductible with employees. Um, and, and so 
uh, the group um, was actually worked with us and their broker uh, to create a group HRA that was going to effectively put them back into a place where their their health insurance deductible went from two thousand dollars back to five hundred. Um, so as they transitioned, right, step down in coverage level, but big savings and premiums. Um, and, um, and so what does that solution actually look like that we ended up implementing? So, um, with the group HRA structure in this specific case, um, the employees continue to be responsible, or the, the employees are now responsible for the first $500 towards their deductible spend. And once they have hit the $500 deductible, uh, the organization will cover the next $1,500 towards uh, towards the deductible. And so the the coverage in this case is actually fairly comprehensive, right? So from a benefits and a services that are covered, it's incredibly comprehensive um, and aligns, you know, pretty much uh, aligns with their with their group health insurance coverage, uh, but really enabled the company to be able to, um, you know, tell their employees, hey, we understand the actual deductible may have gone up, but we're putting this structure into place so that for you, your deductible effectively, right, your exposure is now going to be capped at still that $500, just like it was before. And so what the group was able to achieve, having looked at kind of utilization of the plan in most instances, right, um, the the thing to keep in mind here, if, if I take a couple of steps back, is the group was facing a, a a big rate increase because they had a few people that were high utilizers of healthcare and were hitting that deductible every single year. A majority of the group wasn't actually even getting to the five hundred dollars, and certainly wasn't spending above five hundred dollars on on the deductible front. And so, what the group's been able to do is essentially lower their premiums on the group health insurance by increasing that deductible. But they know because the HRA is a utilization based model that their spend most likely on the HRA side is actually going to end up being lower. And so their full cost savings still end up being pretty substantial for them. Um, so you're right. Like the, the first bullet here, what's that benefit? Cost savings. Number two, I think, you know, if we go back to the initial reason and the challenge that the group had is they really wanted to provide some security to their employees. They knew that increasing that that deductible from 500 to 2000 uh, was going to be a difficult one for a lot of employees. Um, and this really provides an employee back, employer backstop on that increase in in, in deductible. Uh, and I think for, you know, this group and other groups as well, when when thinking about uh, really creative solutions like this, it allows you to both retain, but also I think attract your talent, um, ensuring that people are are happy with the coverage they're offered, they feel financially secure. Um, I think is going to make them much much happier working working at an organization. So those those are our primary case studies. I think as a quick you know kind of rehash, right? I think I I started with. Hey, the the ICRA is something that a lot of people have been talking about, and I think it's being utilized and and as it should, right? We're seeing a lot of this as well in a very clear use case of ICRA is going to be used for health insurance premiums only, and we're going to help drive cost, and that's what we've seen, right? As you'll see here, bullet point number two, as you've seen increased cost pressure in the group market, right? A lot of groups are searching for alternative solutions. Um, but I think that the thing we have to remember here is uh, a benefit package that a company offers with an ICRA isn't just the health insurance or health insurance premiums. It doesn't have to be. It can be if that's what the group wants. But there's so much more that HRAs can do, whether it's the ICRA, the GCHRA, um, even the QSERA in the small group world. There is so much that you can do. Um, to both contain costs for the employer, but also drive really meaningful benefits for your employee bases or their employee bases, right? So when we think about the alignment of incentives, um, what do employers want? They want to be able to offer affordable, right, for the company, but also meaningful and valuable benefits, right? That That is achievable and doable with the HRA. Uh, for the employees, what do they want? They want affordable coverage, and they want to feel like they're valued. Um, 
and 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 HRA again, depending on what employees and the employers want, I think that is um that's a win for employees as well. Um and so we're we're really starting, I think, to see you know the HRA uh, be used in in a lot more creative situations, um, but I I don't think we're 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 really seeing the full potential of the market yet uh, because there's a lot I think that we can we can do, um, and and again if we look at the stats right it's it's happening across the board. Um, you're seeing large ALEs uh, increasing ICRA adoption. People are getting more familiar and comfortable with the idea of an ICRA. Um, and 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 again, I want to I want to reemphasize, right? An ICRA doesn't just have to be health premiums; it can be so much more. Uh, but you really need a, uh, a an ICRA and HRA partner that understands that and can help you design compliant but also creative structures that are within the confines of the regs, but are going to help you service your clients better than any other broker can out there. Um. And so as we kind of look at, you know, 2024, where are the opportunities, I think it's at as 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 groups see more cost pressure on on fully insured plans, um, what you're going to see is you're going to see groups out there looking for alternatives, right? We saw it in 23. We're going to see more of it in 24. We've certainly seen this. And so HRAs are going to really become, I think, an attractive funding mechanism for employers, because what you're doing is you're giving them a self-funded plan with a capped liability. Like that is a very, very powerful plan design. Um, and, 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 and again, there's a lot of flexibility that can be built in. I think the other thing to keep an eye on in, in 24 is we're starting to see states really incentivize um, HRE utilization. We saw our first in 23, right? We're going to see how it plays out in 24, but with Indiana offering a tax credit to employers that are utilizing ICRAs, um, I think if it's successful in Indiana, we're going to see other states adopt a similar mechanism. If that happens, I think one, right, uh, as producers and brokers, we have to be familiar with the ICRA. We have to be very comfortable with it. But I think where where you can differentiate yourself with a partner like LifeRaft is understanding how and when to deploy different versions of the HRA and what can and can't be included to really meet those tricky situations, right? Um, I think if ICRA really gains some popularity, a lot of folks that are focused on the group market are gonna be doing plain vanilla ICRAs, but that's not where I think the real value is that folks can add, right? We as, as fiduciaries and brokers and producers add value when we really understand our, employers, our, our employer client's business, we understand their challenges and we bring them cost-effective creative solutions to address those. And, you know, when I think about for, for us as kind of brokers and producers and, and, and people that are working with, with employer clients, what do we need to be successful, right? I think number one, um, you all as, as the folks that work closely with employers need full customization. You need tools that are gonna allow you to fully customize an HRA. Um, that's what we do at LifeRaft, right? That is our, our goal and our objective is to give our broker partners and our producer partners the tools to be able to implement the solutions that they need uh, in a way that they understand and in a way that you can easily uh, you can easily communicate that with your employees. And I think there's two components to that. The first is, you know, how, how do we help you as your partner um, and and the the resources that we have? But then also our our technology, right? I think the technology can be one of the 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 biggest uh, friction points when you're thinking about implementing an HRA. Um, and so, you know, for as as Life Raft, that's really our focus: is how do we help you all be creative and really serve as a resource to to structure uh, innovative uh, solutions for your clients. And then give you the technology to 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 implement that very very simply. Uh, and so I think there's you know from a market perspective there there's opportunities here, uh, and all of the HRA providers we all need to do a better job of this as we look at working with brokers and producers. Uh, but this is really our our core focus. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip over uh, the last couple of slides here. They're just general information. 
Uh, but that's that's what we have for you guys today. I, I again, I really appreciate you joining today. Thank you so much. Uh, as you can tell, I'm I'm super passionate and super excited about uh, what we do here at LifeRaft and the power of utilizing the HRA to help solve really tricky um, benefit uh, benefit challenges.